All right. Well, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Pastor Mary, and tonight we are learning about prayer. We are going to look at prayer. The biggest question is, what is prayer, right? If you look at the bottom of your notes there, I actually put the Strong's Concordance to pray, and I'm not going to try to pronounce that. Well, let me see here. Bro, shush, I'm sure I could have tried to find an audio for that. Um, and it, it means to interact with the Lord by switching human wishes or ideas for his wishes as he imparts faith or divine persuasion. I was just like, wow. And it, it's so funny because that word is also close related to faith. So here's the thing, like as humans, we have these desires, right? We have these ideas of what we think needs to happen. And so we go to God through prayer to have him do it. Now, when I'm teaching this to kids or in different places, I always just say prayer is just conversation with God, right? But what happens in that conversation is he is taking those ideas and the things that we desire, and he's going to take that and look, look at the situation and move on your behalf, but do it through his idea, through the way that he needs to answer that request. Does that make sense? So it's kind of like when a little kid comes up to their mom and says, like, I'm hungry, I want jelly beans. And as the mom, you look at him and say, you just woke up, you need scrambled eggs, right? And then maybe you can have a few jelly beans in the afternoon for your snack. And you give them scrambled eggs. What is it happening? That child is giving you their wish or their idea of what needs to happen. And then as a parent, you're looking at the situation, you're making a better choice for them. And you're fulfilling that wish with your idea of how that should happen. So prayer is our way of communicating to God our needs and what our wants are. What's really important that we need to remember for prayer is that he wants us to go to him, and that's why it's closely related to faith. Now, if I don't believe that Jeff will help me start my car if my car won't start, I won't go to him if my car won't start, even if he's in the building. I might call AAA, right? He might walk by when he goes to leave in the parking lot and be like, Mary, what's going on? Oh, I needed a jump for my car. And he might say, well, Mary, I had jumper cables in my truck. Why didn't she ask me? I would have been willing to help you. Oh, I didn't think you'd take time to help me. But we do that with God all the time, right? You ask somebody, like, why didn't you pray? Well, I didn't think God cared about that, or I didn't think God would help me with that, or I didn't think I could talk to God about that. And so then we try to figure out the situation. And so prayer is part of faith because you're saying, I believe that God wants to help me, that God is willing to help me, right? Now, if I know that Jeff would be more than willing to help, or if I saw Dan out there, or say I saw Kim out there, and she's got her car and some jumper cables in the back, and I know they're willing to help, I have a belief that that person is willing to help me, so I'm going to go ask. You never ask somebody if you don't think they're willing to help, right? But you go and you ask the person that you have the faith in, that you believe they're going to want to intercede on your behalf. So then we get these questions of, well, what can I pray for? What are the ways I can pray? And then that whole faith thing is, can he really hear me, right? We have to remember that in the world, historically, there's atheistic beliefs where there is no God, everything is by chance. Then we have an agnostic faith. And a lot more people can grasp that one because the thought that everything is just totally random, right? If you truly understand how a DNA and our cells and mitochondria and all that work or um, just the formation of the earth and how the access and all that different stuff, you wouldn't believe that it's just all random. So some people will believe, well, there has to have been a God who created all this, but an agnostic belief is that he's up there, but he doesn't interact with our day-to-day -day lives. He created everything, he made everything, but he doesn't ever interact with me. And there's a lot of people that believe that, right? And so if I believe that there's a God up there, but that he doesn't interact with my day-to-day -day life, I'm not gonna talk to him. I'm not gonna pray to him if I don't believe that he's hearing me or cares about my day-to-day -day life. And so that's why, you know, with lesson one, we talked about how he wants to have that relationship with us. He wants to persuade us. So we want to answer these questions. Our questions today is if we all have a good belief that prayer is me communicating to God my day, right? Because that's part of prayer is just talking to him, having that relationship with him. And then my desires, right? And trusting that he's going to answer with the way that he sees best as a loving father for my situations. 
then we have the left of the questions of what am I allowed to pray for? Is there anything I can't pray for? And what are the ways I can pray, right? And can he really hear me? Um, is really something we addressed in that first lesson that he really does want to have that relationship with us. So now let's look at the modern day views. What are some modern day things that people believe about prayer, believe about God, and I'm sure you've heard this one. God helps those who help themselves, right? Did you know that's not in the Bible? I grew up thinking that that was a Bible verse. I honestly believe that. But we know that that's not what God's word says. I have down here Psalms 34, 10, and I like to look at the second half of that. It says, those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Well, how do I seek the Lord? I have to look for him, right? I have to go to him. And all these verses are on the bottom of your sheet in case you don't have time to look it up. But um, the Lord seek, or the Lord, those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. So when um, we seek him out, we receive from him. First Chronicles 16, 11 says, Seek the Lord continually. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. So here we have, look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. We're told in the Bible to go to God, not just to do it on our own, right? That's a lack of faith or it's pride. If we say, well, I don't need to pray about that. I don't need to go to God. But now what is the other modern day thought that kind of hinders us from going to God in prayer? I should pray for others, but not myself. This one, I don't know if there was like a minister in the little town of Bel Air in northern Michigan, or if this happened all over the world, but I know a lot of people in Bel Air, like when I would say something about prayer, they would make a point and they were proud of the fact, and they would say to me, well, I never ask God for anything for myself, but I'll pray for you, but I'll pray for this situation. Now, what is the underlying thought with that? Somehow, this is going to make me look unselfish, and God is going to bless me more, like, somehow they have this thought that literally, like, I'm not allowed to pray for myself, but I'll pray for you. And that means that God's going to really hear me because I never pray for myself. But yet the Bible is so very clear where God is seeking that relationship with us. He wants to bless us. That it would be kind of like if my 20-year-old son, like, on every his birthday came up and he said, I said, you know, Dylan, your birthday's coming up. I really want to do something special for me, for you. I want to help you. And he's like, well, yeah, but the neighbor kid doesn't have any food. Let's just go buy him food. I'm like, okay, yeah, well, let's go do that. And we get done. We give the food to the neighbor kid. And, okay, now, but tomorrow's your birthday. I really want to do something special for you. Well, no, you can't do anything for me. Well, but you're my son, and I want to do something special for you. Well, no, 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 this other person over here, they need this. Let's go do something for them. I'm like, okay, we can go do that. We have a heart and we want to do lots of things for other people. But as your mother, right, or as your father, I want to do something special for you, my child. And they say, well, I would never ask you for anything. How does that make you feel when somebody says, like, like, like if Jeff was in the parking lot and I called AAA and he's like, Mary, I dropped our tables right here. Why can't I help you? Oh, I would never ask you for anything, Jeff. I, no, I don't, I don't want to bother you. There's something to that about not needing wanted not needing that person to be a part of your life. So when we have this attitude of, I will never ask God for anything in my life, ultimately what you're saying is, I don't need God. I'm a self-made man. I'm a self-made woman. I can do it all on my own. I'll pray for you because you're asking me to pray for you and you need intervention because you need help, but I don't need any help. Ultimately, it's part of a pride issue or it's a false humility to think that I'm going to look better because I don't need that. And so what I really want us to look at and examine as we go through this, that these modern day views really are satanic in nature because they're trying to keep us from having that relationship with God, that we can be real, we can be vulnerable, we can be humble, we can say, God, I need you. God, I need you. There's powerfulness in that. When somebody walks up to you and says, I need you, I need your help, and you begin to help them, there's a blessing in helping somebody else, right? We know it's more blessed to give than to receive. God wants to be a blessing to us. He wants to be able to give to us. But he's also a gentleman, and he won't ever do something for you unless you invite him into this situation and you ask him for help. He doesn't force himself on us. 
That's another thing I'll hear people say is like, well, God knows. I don't need a sanity from him. He knows what's going on. Well, guess what? He knows what's going on. I know what's going on at my neighbor's house, but I'm not going to go over there and do whatever X, Y, and Z for her. You know, it's like when I lived in Bel Air, like I had a friend whose laundry was always piled up, right? Now, when I went to her house, do you think she would have liked it if I went to her laundry room and started doing her laundry? She would have been like, what the heck are you doing? Don't touch my husband's underwear, right? But now if she would, if I would have walked in one day and she would have said, you know what, I really need help. Can you help me with my laundry? I would have said, of course, turn on some Star Trek episodes and let's sit here and talk and let's fold laundry. I remember when I was pregnant with Wesley, I was put on bed rest. No, I was pregnant with Claudia. I was put on bed rest. And somebody called me up and they said, we really want to come help you. What can we do? I said, can you come over and do my laundry? And I mean, if your husband wants to come, I'll have him take the quarter off of this room for my son's bedroom. Because those are two things that I couldn't be being on bed rest that I really needed help. And so guess what? They came one afternoon. Her husband scraped off all this border and painted the room for my son. And she sat there for a couple hours folding my laundry. That was huge. That meant so much. But she never would have come over and messed with my underwear unless I would have invited her in. Right? And here's the thing. God knows where your dirty underwear is. But he's not going to come over and mess with it unless you invite him in. Because he's a gentleman. And so when we say, God knows my situation, I don't need to pray to him, we're basically saying, I am not going to invite him in, and I'm assuming that he'll do something just because. But God's word is very clear. Come to me. Seek me, right? Seek the Lord. Seek, pray, ask. And so we're going to look at all the different Bible verses that back this up. But that modern day view really needs to be broken off of our mindset. It's not godly. Why would Satan want us to not pray? Hmm. I wonder why he would want us to pray. Because there's power in prayer that deepens our relationship. And guess what? When you pray consistently and then God begins answering that prayer, so what does that do? It strengthens your faith. Now you've got a testimony. Now you want to be able to share that with other people. And so it's very powerful when we go to God and pray. So now then, what is the historical church view? And for those of you who haven't been here, or haven't seen the videos, when I talk about the church historical view, I'm talking about the universal church that started, um, you know, 2,000 years ago when Jesus rose from the grave. It wasn't until the 1500s that we broke off from the universal church. It was just the Christian church. Universal was the name Catholic. So it was the Catholic church. In the 1500s, Protestants uh, broke off, and so now there's different types of faiths in the Christian um, faith and denominations. But historically, as we look, what eventually got taught, and we know the reason why the Protestants broke off is because there went through a period of time when there was a lot of um, people being moved up in the Catholic Church and the Universal Church at that time through money and through different things, and they, we talked about how they just would do the services in Latin, and only certain people would be encouraged to read the Bible, and certain people would be put on pedestals, right? All the rest of us would just believe whatever was said. So with prayer, it wasn't just the word that was, okay, it's in Latin, and only certain people can read God's word or truly understand, but it was also with prayer. They were told that Prayer is only heard by important people. That there were saints, there were popes, there were bishops, there were, there were priests. And they could pray on your behalf and God would hear them. And we do have children's ministry, if, if you're curious, just to let you know. It's downstairs in the classroom, the third door on the left. So, um, but certain prayers that came from like special people would be heard. And so if I really wanted prayer, if I was just a common everyday person and I didn't know what God's word said because I couldn't read Latin because they only had the Bible in Latin, I would never know that God's word was so very clear that I want you to pray, seek me, seek me. Um, and we're going to look um, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament and see that God listened to all of their prayers. Okay, so but that's what historically was taught for a very long time. So then the, the next thing they taught was because the everyday person wanted to be able to pray. So then they got taught certain prayers, right? So they were taught like the Our Father prayer. There were certain prayers like called Hail Marys. There were certain forgiveness prayers. And so then what we were taught is 
if you want to say a prayer, here's a prayer that's scripted. And if you just repeat this prayer for this situation, then there would be saints and different people. Like maybe this saint um, is a saint of houses. And this is a saint of saint of animals. And this is a saint of marriage. And this is a saint of motherhood. So they would each have like their own prayer. So if you wanted to pray about your children, you might pray the motherhood prayer. If you wanted to pray about your animal, maybe there's an animal prayer. And so there were certain prayers. And again, what happened is this turned prayer into ritual instead of relationship. Because there's nothing wrong with scripted prayers. I actually have some scripted prayers that talk about spiritual warfare that I'm going to pull out in, in further lessons. But prayers don't have to be scripted. You can pray them, but that can always be your launching point then for even more intimate prayer in relationship and going to God um, in detail. I like to look at the Our Father prayer as an outline. When I get up and I preach on Sundays, I have like an outline of certain things I want to talk about. And then so like, okay, I'm going to talk about this. And I've got this part written down, but then I'm going to then share on that topic. So, like, when I go before God, I can look at the Our Father prayer, which we're going to look at here in a little bit, and say, okay, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. What is that sentence saying? Okay, he's in heaven. I'm acknowledging where he is. I'm acknowledging who he is. Hallowed his, be his name. It's one honor to you. So I'm going to take the first few minutes, and when I pray, I'm going to worship God. God, you are a good God. And so I use that as my outline. So when I go and I sit down and I write out my prayer, I'm talking to God, I might start off with, Oh, Father, I need to come to you today. You're just so awesome. You're so amazing. You're a great God. You make, you're the maker of heaven and earth. And then I go on, you know, give us this day our daily bread, right? What are my daily needs? Today I don't need any food, but man, I need to have something of words to say when I'm dealing with this person that's really angry with me. I got a meeting today at 4 o'clock. This is my daily need. This is what I need today. And I'll, you know, forgive my, my trespasses if I forgive those who trespass against me. Oh, Father God, what are my relationships like right now? I got this person over here that, oh, they made me so mad, you know. Forgive me and all the ways I said to her and, and, and pray for her, right? So I use it as an outline. I don't necessarily use it as a ritual. That's the only prayer I do. What's interesting is if you hear, see here in Psalms 102, verse 17, it says, He will respond to the prayer of the destitute. He will not despise their plea. You see that in Psalms 102. So what is? why did I pick that one as we're talking about this topic? Because I wanted you to see that... He doesn't just respond to the high and mighties, to the prophets, to the priests, right? He responds to even the destitute. The Bible is very clear that anyone can go to him, and he is going to respond to them as you go to him in prayer. So that was the historical point of view. So just because this is a modern-day view or a historical point of view does not mean it's right, right? We need to look at that and say, okay, why do I have this tendency and we need to understand, you know, why it kind of got started. But now, let's look at what does the Bible actually say. So we like to look at the Old Testament, see what their kind of views were, and then see how maybe it might have changed once Jesus came, and now that this relationship has become open. So in the Old Testament, and some things don't change that much, right? Like with prayer, we're going to see that it's pretty good, right? Number one, prayer was encouraged. Prophets and leaders would write out their prayers, they would sing their prayers, they would say their prayers. This Bible, the majority of it is like the copies of people's prayer journals. Like you, most of us don't realize that until we actually start reading it. But the Psalms, like a lot of them they would sing, but these were prayers from their heart. And sometimes we would see the response from God as the Holy Spirit would speak to them. We'll see that again in Habakkuk. But we see... In Psalms 145, verse 18, the Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. So the Lord is near to those who call upon him. Well, there you go. Maybe Satan doesn't want us to pray because when we spend time calling on him, the Lord is near us, right? It brings us closer to God. He's always there, but again, as a gentleman, he's not going to force himself on us. So if we introduce ourselves and pull on him in relationship, then he is near to us. Jeremiah 29, 12 says, Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. See, in the Old Testament, repeatedly it is promised that if you call on me, if you pray to me, I will hear you. I will draw, be near you, 
And so we see in the Old Testament that prayer was encouraged not just for the, the leaders, but for everyone. God hears their prayers, both important people and non-leaders. And the biggest thing that we need to see in the Old Testament, and it's going to follow us along into the New Testament, is that God wants us to pray. It pleases him. We see in Proverbs chapter 15, verse 8, The Lord detests the sacrifice of the wicked, but the prayer of the upright pleases him. Now, as we go, we might think like, well, I'm not upright. I, you know, I sin, I do things. Well, we know as we go into the New Testament that we're all considered righteous for believing in Christ. Anything that we, we have done, any of our sins, is covered by the blood of Jesus. So as upright people, it pleases the Lord when we pray. He wants us to take time to talk to him. I often ask people, like, can you imagine if your son went off into the military and he tells you, okay, once a week on Sunday, I can make one five-minute call. All right, so wouldn't you, if you knew that at like one o'clock in the afternoon, he was calling for five minutes and that was the only time you could talk to him, wouldn't you say, when somebody says, oh, hey, let's go out to lunch, fine, but at one o'clock when that phone rings, I gotta step away. Wouldn't you take the call because you wanna talk to your son and see how, how he's doing, what's going on? You would make time to talk to him. But yet God is standing there saying, let's talk. Let's talk. I want to hear about your day. I want to, like, what needs do you have? You know, what, what relationship issues do you need to forgive somebody that you need to work through? Let's talk. Let's talk. Like, every day, he wants to talk to us. And so many times, and, and maybe this isn't you. Maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm the only one that's ever done this. But it's kind of like, sometimes you just get busy, right? You just, like, get up. I remember this used to be my daily routine. Like, okay, all oh, right. Hi, God. Good morning. Hope you're doing good. And then you run off. And then and then you really never was intentional with your prayer. And then last you're laying your head at night. And you're like, okay, I better say a quick couple prayers. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray to the Lord. My soul takes peace. If I die before I awake, I pray to the Lord. The soul may take or whatever, right? I mean, okay, I did my prayer. Or I did my heart. You know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And then you said your prayer and you're done. But really, if the, every time I saw my husband, I just said the same sentence to him in the morning, and I said the same sentence to him at night, and then I went to bed, and I never talked to him again the rest of the day, our relationship would be stilted. My relationship with my husband means, like, throughout the day, I'm sending him texts, I'm sending him little cute, little kissy emojis, I'm, you know, I'm talking to him when I get home from work, I'm, you know, laying in bed, talking to him about the future and our plans, I'm telling him about some situation I got to deal with the next day and he's doing the same with me right that's a relationship right I don't have the same relationship with any of you that I have with him he knows things about me that none of y'all know but guess what I even got one better than that my father up in heaven knows things that even my husband doesn't know about because I talk to him about him <laughs> and you know there's things that um as you get into a deeper prayer relationship with your father, your relationship changes. Now, we're talking about prayer, and I know I promised I'd be short tonight. But as you begin to ask him for things and he shows up in your life, it really does increase your faith. And when we got this building, the way God answered prayers, and I know most of you have heard the story about the exit lights, has anyone not heard the story of the exit lights? Okay. I'll tell you real quick the story of the exit lights. We, when we got the building, it had sat empty for two years. And I was like, in one month, we're having our first service. And everybody was like, what? And I was like, we can do it. God will help us. We can do it. So we're cleaning. We're painting. We're organizing. We're like literally moving junk from rooms to shoving them in other rooms so we had certain rooms ready. And one of the big things was like, oh, Hey, the exit lights don't aren't illuminated and I knew that like for fire code and stuff we need to have the exit lights illuminated and different people would say to me Mary you need to get those exit lights fixed and I'm like well, can you fix them and they'd be like no I don't know how and I'm busy I'm doing this I'm doing that and so literally it was like okay it's Monday and service our first service is Sunday and somebody brought it up again and I was just <coughs> like okay I've got to figure this out and all of a sudden it dawned on me Forget this. It's not my job to figure this out. God, this is your idea. This is your building. This, these are your exit lights. I'm not going to figure this out. Nobody else knows how to figure this out. It's all on you. 
And I went to bed and I slept well that night and I did not think about those exit lights at all. That required a tremendous amount of faith to just trust that I wasn't gonna worry about the exit lights. I literally felt so much peace in finally giving that over to God that when I got here in the morning, I went and checked because I thought maybe he sent an angel last night and they're all just on. And I seriously went and looked. That's like how like much peace I felt. And they were all still out. And I was like, God, it's on you. And I walked away and I didn't think about him again for the rest of the day. And about halfway through the day, I'm sitting in the back talking to somebody, and all of a sudden a strange man walks up, and he says, are you Mary? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, oh, my wife's a friend of yours, and I saw the sign out front, and, you know, we're planning on coming on Sunday, and I'm in between jobs, and so I have the day. Do you need help with anything? I'm like, oh, yeah. And so I gave him a list, and exit lights were not on that list, because, again, we had so many big things to deal with that I didn't even have that on the list. And so he got done everything on the list, and he comes to find me, and he's like, well, I got all this stuff done, but I don't know if you're aware or not, but your exit lights are out. And I'm like, I know, I said, but nobody knows how to fix them. And he's like, well, I know how to fix them. And so he goes off, he does all this stuff, he comes back, he's like, go to the store and buy these things. So that afternoon, I went and bought those things, and the next day, they were all installed, and the exit lights all worked. Now, he answered that prayer. I would have preferred an angel came the night before and just did it, and I wouldn't have had to go to the store and buy the light bulbs. But God looked in his infinite wisdom and decided to send this young man to come help me. Right. Here's the thing. When all of a sudden he answered that prayer, it's like, oh, well, I'm not going to worry about this, Lord. This is your responsibility. And all of a sudden somebody would come by and help with that. And all of a sudden I'm like, Lord, you want us to do this? Fine. Now that's your responsibility. And so now it's changed my prayer life and the amount of time I worry about things with this building. I just give it to God. And, and if he leads me to maybe say something in an email or to post something, I do. But it's changed who I am in my prayer life because I trusted him with some things and watched how he answered those prayers. Now, before the building, I could even tell you about other things. And this is going to sound super silly, but literally on Sundays, I've been praying that the weather is not bad. And all last week, it was all this big storm's coming on Sunday. This big storm's coming on Sundays. And... You know, different people are like, well, I don't know about this Sunday, Mary. I know you've been praying, and Sundays have been looking pretty good. But this Sunday, this big storm's coming. I'm like, our God is a great God. Our God is a big God. And I have peace that on Sunday morning, when people come to church, when, my prayer was that when they look out the window, it looks nice. I don't know if you guys were watching the radar on Sunday, but it literally split. And all of the snow dumped north of us, and all the snow, there was bad storms south of us. But literally, I have like, I was going to take a picture on my phone. It was like a V, and Bay City totally was clear from the hours of 9 until noon. That is our God. Our God is that big. But you've got to pray big. You've got to ask him those prayers, and you've got to do it with faith. And you get to the point where he gives answering those prayers, answering those prayers. And again, I was like, I'm like, the last few Wednesdays have been really bad. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to start praying for Wednesday nights, too. And again today, it was like, oh, we're supposed to get all this snow. It's supposed to be that bad. I'm like, God, you can snow all at once in the morning. But by the time our class starts, like, let the roads be good enough that people come. Why do I say all that? It pleases him to show up. He wants to help us. He wants to answer these prayers. He wants to answer these prayers. So now, okay, we looked at the scriptures in the Old Testament. We can go on and on looking at examples, like, I mean, the way I set this up, we're still, we still go like hour, hour and a half, and um, eventually we're going to take all of these lessons to the printers and have them make like little booklets, so that in the future as we continue teaching this class, it's all in a booklet. But at the end of each chapter, I'm going to have all of the verses listed out, and I'll have like a little one page, little, or one sentence for each of the different scriptures as to why that scripture and passage is important for this, because there's so much more. We could look in the Old Testament of the people who prayed big prayers and how God showed up and the way he answered those prayers with angels and with miracles. Just, I mean, one of the prophets, like, they wanted to kill him. Like, this one king says, I'm going to kill you. And, God, and that prophet just prayed. And all of a sudden, they woke up one morning, and they, um, the assistant looked out and says, oh, my gosh, there's this huge army, and they're going to come in here, and they're going to kill you. They want your head. And he's like, no, our God's bigger. Look at the angels. Lord, open his eyes and show him the angels. And so he said a prayer to ask God to open his eyes. And all of a sudden, the assistant looked out, and you could see all the angel armies surrounding them. 
And then he prayed. He said, Lord, you know, close your eyes. Let him not realize it. He's walking. He had so much faith. He walked out there and said, who are you looking for? And they're like, well, we're looking for the prophet. He's like, huh, well, let me take you somewhere. And so he takes him way to a different thing, to the enemy, and leaves him there and walks away. And then all of a sudden their eyes were open and they realized they had their dead baby boy. But there's so many stories in the Old Testament of people praying and God answering prayers, doing big miracles. What's the difference between then and now? We don't ask for these big things, right? We, we, well, am I worthy? Can I ask for that? He was a prophet, right? Can I ask God to change the whole weather pattern for Bay City and for our church to go to church? Yep, I can. If I'm his daughter, I'm his favorite. You're his favorite too, but I actually believe it and I'm willing to ask him to, to do those things, right? you got to see yourself as his favorite, as the one that when you ask daddy for something, he might do it in his best interest, in his best way, right? But he is going to answer your prayers. So what about the New Testament? Now Jesus is on the scene, the Messiah is here. What does he say to us? He tells us to pray. So many times he tells us to pray. So many times he prays. It's so cool how many times it's recorded. And when it's recorded, it's like he's praying. I mean, they would pray all the time, right? But they would record times like he would go in the evening up in the mountains and he would take time to pray. This is different than our just our quick little prayer wherever. Now, we're also told to pray continually, so I'm not saying the quick prayers are bad prayers. Those are good prayers. But if Jesus took time to do special, deep, like this is my time to have just fellowship with God, relationship time, if Jesus needed to do that repetitively, I need to do that repetitively. When is your deep, personal time with God? What time of the day do you set aside and really have a good conversation with him? Again, I have certain times I set aside to talk to my kids. I have certain times I set aside to talk to Jesse. I have certain times I set aside to talk to my husband, right? If I'm having meetings and trying to different people to connect with, there's a certain time in my calendar it says, Tuesday, 3 o'clock, I'm talking to Kelly. On my calendar, it says Thursday at 4.30, I'm talking to Danielle. Like, I set times of uh, Tuesdays at 10 o'clock, I'm talking to Sandra. There's, I've got time scheduled for my relationships because I find them very valuable and important, and I like to have a time set aside. For some of you, I meet with you once a month, right? For some of you, every couple months. I set time for our relationship for us to have a good talk. Now, in between time, I might send you a text. I might send you a quick email. I might, you know, wave at you on Facebook or whatever we do there. We poke you. Poke you. Poke, poke. Just don't poke in the eyes. You're okay, right? We take time to talk to our bosses, to our clients, to our kids, to our family members. When is your special time on your calendar for God? When is it? Right? I mean, yeah, you're poking him throughout the day, but when do you really sit down and have a good relationship with God? Now, see, my daddy is pretty special, and I like to talk to him every day. So for me, it's in the morning, typically. Right, depending on, I mean, if I've got like an 8.30 in the morning appointment, I might, depending on what time I get up, it might be earlier, it might be like, okay, I'm going to sit down and talk to him at 10 when I get back. It might depend, right? Obviously, God's flexible. He understands. We don't have to be ritualistic with it. But I make sure I take time to pray. Jesus took time to pray. What's interesting, because of his ministry, it does say like sometimes in the evening he'd be up praying. It says sometimes early in the morning. It said they'd get up in the morning to go find him and he'd be off praying. So it's, we can be flexible with God, but are we doing it? Are we taking time? And maybe you're, literally your work week is just so stressful that like there's some times you can be a little more in depth and other times you can't. For me personally, it's Monday through Thursday. The kids are at school, Todd's at work. I can spend like an hour in God's presence with prayer, um, with talking to him, from hearing from him, doing different things. But maybe on Friday mornings when Todd's home, I might maybe spend 30 minutes, and then on Saturday, Sunday, because I got more things going on, I might just spend 10 minutes, right? You can be flexible. And for some of you, to spend an hour in God's presence seems crazy because maybe you haven't even spent 10 minutes with him. So maybe you just set your timer on your phone for a time when you know, like if every night you go to bed at 10 and you lay there for 20 minutes, put a reminder in your phone that at 10 o'clock it gives you a little single beep and it says, spend time with Daddy or spend time in prayer or whatever, however, it will be a good reminder for you to do that. And so Jesus repetitively tells us to pray. We see here in Luke chapter 11, the disciple, well, I'm going to read the whole passage because it's really good. It says, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. So they're seeing that praying is really important to Jesus. 
and they want to be taught. And so he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be that your name, your kingdom come, give us each day our daily bread, forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us, and lead us not into temptation. I find it really interesting when we look at it, we're going to look at it again, but again, this can be an outline for us. We honor God, our Father. That was, we guys have to understand, during that time, that was huge for them to do. He not only referred to God as the Father, but he wants his disciples to refer to God as the Father, right? I mean, he goes into John 14, 15, really in depth about that, but that's huge, number one. Are you praying to a loving dad? For all of us that have daddy issues, that's hard. I, I've counseled with a lot of people that have a hard time praying to the Father. They'll pray to Jesus, but they don't want to pray to the Father. Even though Jesus told us repetitively to pray to the Father in my name. Why? Because if they had a poor example on earth of a loving Father, then why would there be a loving Father up in heaven? But that's a whole other sermon and teaching series that I'm not going to have time to get into. But I'm just telling you, if we're obedient to God who sent Jesus down, we're supposed to pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Okay, acknowledging God, give us our day, our daily bread. What are your daily needs? Forgive us our sins. And now if I ask for forgiveness, then I'm not coming into his presence feeling guilty or that I don't deserve it. So I often teach my kids, confess it right away, right? After you acknowledge God and how great he is, confess anything that you're struggling with if you think that's going to separate you from the love of Christ. The Bible says nothing will separate you from the love of Christ. Forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Obviously, God is not leading us into temptation. But if we say, lead us not into temptation, what are we saying? What's like the opposite of that? Sometimes we have negative statements. Send me away from temptation. Rescue me from temptation, right? But I know that I'm consistently tempted with, like, alcohol or sexual sins or with gossip or with envy. You know, I need your help with these temptations that plague me. Help me fight against those. But the passage doesn't really end. We kind of stop there. But if we keep reading, it says, Then Jesus said to them, Suppose you have a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, Don't bother me. The door is already locked, and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, Yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. Jesus is saying, look, if you would ask your neighbor for something and you would be able to persist on it, he will eventually do what you need. And he's using that as an example of talking to the Father. What is he saying? He's like, if you'd be willing to be bold in asking a friend to help you, how much more should you be willing to go to your Father in heaven? So I say to you, because you'd be willing to ask a neighbor for help, so I say to you, ask your father. Don't be afraid to go to the father to ask him things. How insulting is that, that you'd be willing to ask me to come over and help you with something, but you won't ask God? Right? Well, you know, I'd let you, Mary, come into my house, but I don't want to let so-and-so come in. They might judge me. They might whatever. But you won't ask God in? He said, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will you give him a snake instead? Of course, none of them would, right? None of them are going to do that. Or if he asks for an egg, would you give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, right, humans, we make mistakes, Jesus says we're all evil, so don't even try to be perfect, don't even tell me you're trying to be good, Jesus says you're evil, I'm evil, it's his goodness that we need. If even though you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Now we spent last week talking about the Holy Spirit, why is he saying we need the Holy Spirit when it comes to prayer? The Holy Spirit fills us, and he is with us in that relationship. He empowers us. And so we watched the video on the Holy Spirit if you didn't get that. But part of the reason and purpose of the Holy Spirit is to help us with this prayer. 
So he wants to give us things. He wants us to seek him out. He wants us to receive. And the Holy Spirit empowers us. He comforts us. He counsels us as we pray. But he continuously gives us these examples of if, if you as humans answer the requests of your children, how much more is the Father going to answer these requests for you? So Jesus tells us to ask, seek, knock. He also says, be persistent and don't stop praying. When does he tell us to be persistent? Well, if we look here a little bit further in Luke, Luke chapter 18, it says, Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them they should always pray, always pray, and not give up. How about you? I, have you ever given up on something? I've given up, right? Because as humans, we're not very patient. We want instant gratification. We want it now. Well, I asked God about that, and he said no. Well, how long did you ask him and wait for that, patient for that? Well, you know, like a week. Well, you know, if you ever read the Bible, I mean, some of these guys, like Joseph, how many years was he in prison before? Like God, you know, I mean, sometimes we're not done learning a lesson, right? Joseph, most of us don't realize this, but Joseph was... I hate to use the word like hillbilly, but I'm trying to make it equate, would have been like, like a hillbilly compared to Egyptian royalty. When he was grabbed as a slave and thrown in Potiphar's house, he didn't know the customs of Egypt. If in that moment he would have been elevated to his place, he would have not known the language, he would not known the customs, he would not have been the right man for the job. He had to spend years in Potiphar's house and learn etiquette. And then when he went down to the prison, and which was the royal prison, he learned everything about the pharaoh. He learned what his likes were, his dislikes were, because he's dealing with the baker, he's dealing with the butler, he's dealing with all these different people that are from the pharaoh's palace that get thrown into prison. So by the time he learned all of that, the time was right for God to let him have that opportunity to go up there. But I bet you that entire time he was praying, Lord, get me out of here. Lord, you showed me dreams and visions of me, of everything bowing down to me. When are you going to put me in that leadership role? And God's like, you got a little more things to learn. you got to get, you got to get ready. you got to get ready. It's interesting if you read what it says that the Pharaoh has a dream, and the butler then says, hey, there was this guy in the prison that blah, blah, blah. It's really interesting. They put him in here. I mean, you would assume, but they put him in here. It says that Joseph was taken from the prison, and it says, and he went and he changed, and he washed himself, and he got himself ready, and then he went before the Pharaoh. They make a point to say that. What did he, why didn't he just go the way he looked? He knew. He knew protocol. He knew how he had to look. He knew how he had to fix his hair, the makeup they put on, all the different things. He got himself presentable. If he would have come out of there just looking like somebody from the jail, then they wouldn't have picked him to be second in command. What is my point? Sometimes we pray and we want an instant fix. And God wants us to be walked into that opportunity or that job with all the skills and everything ready so that way it sticks. And we aren't patient. We're just frustrated that God didn't fix it immediately for us. So let's look here. It says, when Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them they should always pray and not give up, he said, in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with a plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says, and will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they will get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Why does he keep equating the faith with that? He's saying if you don't have faith, you won't even pray and ask, right? So you have to have a faith in him to be bold enough to ask him. Right? I have absolutely no faith in the fact that Claudia could pay my credit card bill. I do not give Claudia my credit card bill, but I give it to my husband because I have faith and I believe that he could pay my credit card bill. Does that make sense? You only put faith, you only request from somebody who you believe can actually do it. If you believe God can actually help your situation, you will ask him. If you don't believe, if you don't have faith in him, you're not going to ask him. That's why we have to start asking for more than what we are asking for. Because we, we need to believe that he actually cares about every area of our life. 
Now with this parable, like with the one contrasting, see there's comparison parables and there's contrasting parables, all right? So like he's using the example of if even an unjust judge who cares nothing for a widow were, which in that culture would have been the lowest of the lowest in their, their culture, totem pole, if she can get what she wants from being persistent, then the contrast is us as loving children to a loving father, how much more are we gonna get what we are asking for, right? Obviously, in his way. I remember one time I prayed for Matthew to get a new friend at school. Well, guess what? He didn't get a new friend at school, but one of the guys at church started teaching him drum lessons. And so for once a week, for an hour, they would spend time together and talk about life, and he was able to talk to him about all the struggles he was going through. Guess what? God knew that Matthew just didn't need another kid struggling with that nobody wanted to hang out with at that time because he wasn't doing marijuana when all this circle of friends was doing that. But he knew this 25-year-old kid that was a Christian that could help him and talk to him during that time was what he needed. So, like, sometimes we pray for something, but we trust that God will answer it the way he knows is best. So, Jesus told us to ask, seek, and knock, right? He told us to be persistent. And then, towards the end, right, before he's going to go to the cross, he told us that we now need to pray to the Father, because he gave us the original Our Father prayer. But then before he went to the cross, he said, now when you pray, after I go, you have to pray in my name. So, we see that... Um, in John chapter 16, starting in verse 25. Though I have been speaking figuratively, a time is coming when I will no longer use this kind of language. He had been doing a lot of, you know, talk, parables and different things. But I will tell you plainly about my father. In that day, you will ask in my name. I am not saying that I will ask the father on your behalf. No. The Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. See, if we believe in Jesus and that he is the Messiah, then we get that relationship with the Father. I came from the Father and entered the world now. I am leaving the world and going back to the Father. Then Jesus' disciples said, Now you are speaking clearly about without figures of speech. Now we can see that you know all things and that you do not even need to have anyone ask questions. This makes us believe that you came from God. Now, this is just one passage in all of this. I didn't, like I said, I didn't have time to pull out every single one. But Jesus makes it very clear. He said, when I go, you're going to start talking to the Father directly. You pray to the Father in my name. And what's interesting is many people believe, well, I'm praying and Jesus is going, like in my in-between, and, and Jesus will take care of it. But he said very clearly, no, you talk to the Father directly using my name. I don't even need to go speak on your behalf. Because once you believe in me and what I did on the cross, now your relationship to the Father is totally restored. So when I pray, I, I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, you know, I come to you. I always end my prayer, in the name of Jesus, I pray. But I'm praying to the Father because Jesus told me to pray to the Father in his name. So I have the big question, you know, like, well, Mary, for years I've been praying to Jesus. Like I thought in church and I was taught in church to just pray to Jesus. Is God not hearing my prayers? No, God knows your heart. God understands that. But that doesn't mean that we can't read it for ourselves and see what Jesus actually told us to do. Once you have that knowledge, I mean, you know, there's times, there was a time, uh, it was probably four years ago, maybe even longer than that because I had my minivan and I was driving down the road and the roads were all slippery and wet and my car's tires were kind of bald, and I was going too fast, not paying attention. I jerked the wheel, and I lost control of my car. I'm spinning, going down the road. And I tell you what, there was no, Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. All that was someone out of my mouth was, Jesus, 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 Jesus. And all of a sudden, my car, like, straightened out, and I just kept on going. So in that moment, God knew my heart, who I was crying out to, right? There is nothing wrong with the name of Jesus, and we can call on the name of Jesus but I'm just letting you know that when we actually get educated and we learn, we realize there's protocol, right? There is Jesus saying, like, you all want to talk to me, and that's cool, and I'm here with you, but who you really want to connect with is your loving Father. Jehovah, God, he has wanted to have a relationship with mankind all the way from the beginning. Look back to Adam and Eve. And so Jesus came to restore that. And so, yes, Jesus, the Father, the Holy Spirit, they're all God, but most of us, we don't pray to the Holy Spirit. We don't say, I mean, 
we'll talk to the Holy Spirit. You know, there's times where I say, Holy Spirit, fill me. Holy Spirit, come comfort them. But I don't, like, if my every day is, like, hey, Holy Spirit, you know, I really need to do this or that. I know the Holy Spirit is part of God and the Holy Spirit is with me. But the protocol is we go to the Father in the name of Jesus, and then he uses that Holy Spirit into our, in our, into our everyday lives. Now, again, that doesn't mean if, if we do it wrong, he doesn't hear us. It's just this is what Jesus said to do. He said to pray to the Father in my name. Again, read through the book of John, especially starting maybe in verse 13, or chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, if you really, really want to understand that. Because he's very clear about that. So Jesus, what we, what we see in the New Testament is that Jesus tells us to ask. Yeah. I would read John chapters 13 through 16. Yep. He tells us that um, to pray. He tells us to ask, seek not. He tells us to be persistent and don't stop, not to give up. Um, Jesus tells us that once he goes to the cross and rises again, that we will now be able to pray to the Father directly in his name. And we also see Saul telling us, um, you know, obviously we're told to pray for others. So we should. So like in Philippians, I just had a quick example there. Um, Philippians chapter 1, starting in verse 3, where Paul's like, I thank my God every time I remember you, and all my prayers for you, I always pray with joy. So we know that God's word says that we can 